Hello, hello church. I am glad you are there and we are here and we are coming together this morning to worship together. You might go ahead and light candles, inviting the light of Christ into your space. That's one way we do that. Uh, make sure that you have your uh, communion emblems ready for later on and your offering so that we can pray over that that you would be sending in this week. If you haven't yet, also be sure and like our page um, so that you can find us a little easier next time you come looking for us. And let's just start off by inviting God in to this space wherever we are. Will you pray with me? Oh, holy and mighty God, we are so glad to be gathered together across time and space, Lord, to lift our hearts and spirits to you together, Lord, as we come to worship you this day. You are our amazing God, and it is a delight, Lord, to be able to worship together. We are so grateful for this uh, space, Lord, that we can come together virtually. But Lord, you, we know that you are always with us, but we still invite you in. We want to make sure you know, Lord, that you are welcome in our space this day. We want to be so very aware of your presence. So come, gracious God, come, Brother Jesus, come, Holy Spirit, come and be present here in our worship this day. To the power of Christ that we pray. Amen. Dear God, school's different now. I don't understand the world. But I know that when hard things happen, I should pray. So that's what I do. I pray that we can keep learning, whatever that looks like, and that we'll be together, even if it's in a whole new way. God, I pray as we step into the unknown future that you continue to show me things about myself and life, things I can't learn in books. Be with me, God, no matter how this year unfolds. Help us, God, to do our best every day. Even when every day isn't what we thought it would be. Keep us safe and keep us learning one day at a time. Thank you, God. Amen. 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 And a little child shall lead them. The prayers of our children, and we, of course, offer our prayers for our children and young families as they are venturing back into a new school year that looks like no school year they've ever experienced before. But welcome again to worship here this morning. You have found First Christian Church, a caring congregation, joined together in love and faith, serving God by serving the community. And I am glad you are here. And so we're going to start off our worship by singing together. You're in the safety of your home. We're going to sing right here. Uh, Come thou font of every blessing. Fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it. Mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by my help I'm come. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus saw me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. From danger interpose his precious blood. Oh, to grave how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness 
Hands like a felter, bind with mourning hearts to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave all that I love. Hear my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for my count of Let's gather the kids around. We have Dennis Fulford here this morning for our children's message. Good morning. This morning's scripture is out of Exodus. We've, we have left Genesis, and the Jewish people who are held captive in Israel are being oppressed at this point. They have a new Pharaoh, and he doesn't like nor really trust the Israelites. So they are, he is looking at a way to keep them in tow, so to speak. And one of the decrees that he has made is to uh, dispose of any of the uh, Hebrew male children. And that's what brings us to our story this morning. And this is about the, the birth of Moses. And Moses was born to a Hebrew mother. And she was able to hide Moses for about three months. But at three months, it had become to the point that she could no longer hide him. So to protect him, she took him and she put him in a basket. And she covered the basket with bitumen and pitch. And she did that so that the basket would be waterproof and it would float. And she took it down to the Nile and put it in the reeds of the Nile. And there it was found by Pharaoh's daughter. And Pharaoh's daughter had the basket retrieved by one of her maids. And when she opened it up, it was this beautiful baby boy. And Moses' sister was watching from a distance. And so she approached Pharaoh's daughter and asked if Pharaoh's daughter would like for her to fi find a Hebrew woman that would nurse this child until it could be weaned. And that's exactly what she did. She went and found the, found the baby's mother. And she kept the child until he was big enough. And then at that point, she turned him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who raised him as, his own, as her own. And she called the child, Pharaoh's daughter called the child Moses because she raised him up out of the water. And this is the beginning of the great story of Moses, the great leader of the Hebrew people. God's hand was all over the discovery of Moses and Moses' early life to protect him from a Pharaoh that did not trust nor want him to be part of it. And God's hand is in our lives. So as we go through this week, let's look at where God's hands touch our lives as we go forward. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these children. We thank you for their energy. We thank you for their spirit. And we thank you for their inquisitiveness. We pray that you will be with them, that you will guide them, that would give them the strength and the wisdom of Moses as they lead their daily lives and go forward. Pray that we'll be with us all, guide, direct, keep all of us, but particularly keep these children. In Jesus' most holy name we do pray. Amen. Thank you, Dennis. <coughs> Excuse me. 
I got a little frog for some reason. Uh, life in our community, uh, I will let you know if you're living here locally and you want to get up early on Sunday morning and come join us here for live worship at 8.30. We would love to have you join us. Uh, you can watch the What to Expect video so you kind of know as you're coming in uh, what you can expect and how things will go once you get here. Uh, also a reminder that we are continuing our phase two uh, through September 7th, Labor Day at this point. Uh, the uh, virus task team should be meeting soon so that we can uh, give you an idea of what's going to happen after that. And then another reminder too, uh, while the kids are still close by there, you might want to go to our website, which is fccmartinsville.org, and check out the Worship and Wonder page. Uh, Pastor Linda has some great resources for uh, the families there. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's uh, now take a moment here to go to God in prayer. Uh, we always have things that are heavy on our hearts and joys that we want to share with God. And also as we come together as community, uh, our prayers are so powerful. So let's bow together and pray, and then we'll close this prayer with the Lord's Prayer. Will you bow with me? Holy and gracious God, it is uh, such a delight uh, to recognize your presence in our lives, O oh God. And we know that you call us uh, to be good Samaritans, to make this world a better place for all, to stand up to evil, to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with you, O oh God. But to be a good Samaritan, Lord, we really need uh, to be brave, Lord, and we get our strength, our courage, all that we need to do that from you. It's always something we can do, O oh God. We can be in prayer for folks. And as we look back on um, our history, Lord, we know that you are always there ready to give us direction. So as we go to you in prayer, knowing that, uh, Lord, we can fully trust you, we need to listen and tune our ear to you, O oh God, as you teach us how to move out into this world and be the church you truly call us to be. Lord, so often uh, making the world a better place can start right at home as we uh, seek to share your love and, and show grace, Lord, to those in our families, Lord, uh, with our friends and with our immediate community. Lord, it is such an honor to know that there are many ways that we can be the church. We can always uh, find a little way to offer a helping hand and a heartfelt prayer, O oh God, as we seek to uh, reach out and connect with all those that uh, need your love. Holy One, we also, though, have concerns on our hearts. There are those among us, Lord, who are struggling with uh, illness. There are those, Lord, who are dealing with a depression as we continue through this pandemic. And there are others that are having different uh, family problems, Lord, health issues. And so we just stop individually, Lord, to take a moment here to lift up to you those things that are heavy on our hearts this morning. Lord, as we offer our concerns into your hands, we know that you are faithful to care for these that we love so much. And Lord, we also then want to say thank you, to, to lift our voices in praise, Lord, to worship with hearts so full, Lord, of the many blessings you have poured into our lives as individuals, Lord, and also as church. And so we take a moment just now to individually lift our prayers of blessing and praise to you. Oh, what an honor it is to be your people. Uh, what a joy it is to know we are called children of the Most High. Oh, thank you, Lord, for the many blessings you do pour into our lives. And in honor, Lord, of you and your magnificence, we pull our voices together just now and lift up the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever amen Today's scripture is from Exodus. It is excerpts from 
chapters 1 and 2. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase, and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to, to bathe at the river, while her attendants walked along the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying, and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to the Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Question for you. How brave are you? Do you consider yourself brave? <clears throat> Carl Armanding uh, recounts a story uh, from one time when he was in a, a zoo and he was observing a wild cat. And as he was standing there watching the animal in the enclosure, a door opened from the far side of the enclosure and an attendant walked in with a broom. He was amazed that this person was just casually walking into the enclosure. The, the attendant closed the door behind him and began to sweep around the uh, enclosure. The attendant watched the man as he continued to sweep. He noticed he didn't have any weapon on him that he could see. He didn't have any way of protecting himself against this uh, wild cat. And um, he noticed that as he kept sweeping around the enclosure, he got over to the corner where the, the big cat was, and um, he kind of poked the cat with the broom, and the cat kind of hissed at him, and then just got up and walked to the other side of the enclosure. At that point, Carl could keep quiet no longer, and he said, you must be a very brave man. And the attendant kept saying, nah, I ain't brave. He said, well, well then the cat must be very tame. Guy just kept sweeping. Nah, it ain't tame. He said, okay, I'm confused. If you're not brave and the cat's not tame, why isn't that cat attacking you? Well, at this point, the attendant kind of chuckled and looked up from his broom. He said, oh, mister, that cat's old and it ain't got no teeth. <laughs> you know, it's really easy to appear brave and confident when there's no real threat of danger. <laughs> but... When there is a threat of danger, when we can still show confidence and cunning in the face of that danger, that is true bravery. Will you pray with me? Holy God, we ask you just now to wash over us with calm, clarity, and courage. Calm, Lord, that we can set aside any distractions, anything that might be a stirring within us that would pull us away from hearing your still small voice clarity that will uh, allow you to pour yourself into us and help us understand fully the individualized messages you have for each of us and courage oh god that when you put a call on our lives we will be brave and step boldly into that to the power of christ that we pray amen 
And so we're continuing our series here uh, known as uh, Anything But Ordinary. We have been all the way through this in the book of Genesis, and now we are jumping into the book of Exodus. And what uh, Dennis read for you is really the story of Moses' birth that most of us are pretty familiar with. The actual lectionary text was much longer, and so we edited it down for the elder to read. Uh, but you can certainly go and check that out in your own Bible. But I want to give you a section. I want a resection of that uh, part that was left out, and a part that I think we often forget. And this is starting with Exodus 1.15. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shiphrah and the other Puah, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women to see them on their birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. And if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Well, because the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, uh, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them, which was a lie. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. This is a part of the story we, we often forget about. But here we have Shipra and Pua, the two midwives that are named. And interesting enough, both of their names translated from the Hebrew mean beautiful. Now, we have to know that there were more than just two midwives for all of the Hebrew women. There would have been several more. So the fact that the uh, author lists two of these women, uh, then that helps us to understand that all of the midwives would have done this beautiful thing for their people. The quote goes, courage is contagious. When a brave person takes a stand, the spines of others are stiffened. And so these beautiful women did a beautiful thing and saved an entire generation of Hebrew males. It had to take a lot of courage to stand up to Pharaoh. He could have very easily have had them killed for uh, not following through with his instructions. The situation they get in kind of reminds me, makes me think of American servant and, and civil rights activist uh, John Lewis, who would have said they had gotten themselves into some good trouble. And we have to remember that these are women that are doing this. These are women standing up to a male ruler in a male-dominated society. They had to have been terrified when he called them back to ask them exactly why it was that they had allowed the boys to live. Now, from our time and place in the world, we might also be a little shocked uh, to see that this Pharaoh would so casually have these tiny, innocent babies killed. But he was being motivated by fear. Again, when we go back to the text, now a king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. So he doesn't really have a connection to the Israelite people. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase and, in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. In other words, he had them enslaved. He was so fearful of their, uh, their vast numbers. And of course, in vast numbers, he saw great power. And so he was so fearful of that, he had them enslaved and had them start building cities for Pharaoh. But despite this, they kept multiplying. And so Pharaoh had to come up with some way of doing away with them. What's interesting to me, though, is the fact that he wants to kill off the, the male children. He's like cutting off his nose to spite his face. For one thing, he's not showing hospitality to the Israelites who are considered foreigners in his land. And that was a, a big faux pas in this time and place in the world. Everyone in the ancient world was expected to show great hospitality. The other thing is he's looking to shrink his workforce. If he's doing away with the male children, uh, they're the ones that can do all the heavy lifting and the hard work. And so he's looking at uh, doing away with them. But he was driven by fear, and that led him to population control. 
And I wish I could say that is the last time fear led to population control in our world. But not so. Here on American soil, European settlers wanted to eliminate the Native Americans out of fear of them and fear that they could not share the land. Years later, Adolf Hitler had so many Jews uh, slaughtered in Europe, trying to eliminate the Jewish race from Europe, uh, fearing that they could not fit into his perfect Aryan race. In just the second half of the 20th century, we have seen genocide in Cambodia and Rwanda, again, fueled by fear. In 1968, a Stanford University professor named Paul Yorick uh, wrote a book entitled Population Bomb. And in that book, he predicted that the world population was going to explode in the 70s. And when that overpopulation happened, there would be great famine. There would be just world disaster. Uh, there would be great famine. There would be social upheaval. It was going to be a horrific event. And so he advocated immediate action to limit the population of the world. Now, as it turned out, his estimations were grossly inaccurate. However, the suggested measures that he put out there, as harsh as they were, are methods that are used in some 30 countries today, right? We see enforced contraception on women across the world, forced vasectomies on men, permanent sterilizations uh, on citizens, and uh, coerced abortions. Fear can be a big motivator for human beings, and often in that motivation, it leads to us uh, lashing out at others. Hannah Garrity is our artist again for this week, and she reflects on her piece entitled Midwives' Decision. Fear God or fear people, she asks. The Hebrew midwives chose the right path. Here, I have depicted the moment of their decision. Do I risk my life saving the lives of all the Hebrew baby boys, or do I shed the blood of my friend's children, as the ruler has told me to? The wise women look both ways, up to the grandeur of God and down to the flow of blood. The options seem more simple to me from afar than I think they were in the moment. Of course they should break the edict of the king, However, it was incredibly brave, it was incredible bravery to stand up to human power. It is incredible that they were fearless enough to defy and lie to the king. The moral is easier said than done. We must always do the right thing, even when it puts our lives in danger. Be brave. Her words remind me of Hudson Taylor. Uh, he was the founder of the China Inland Mission some years ago, and he always had a plaque that he had in his house wherever he lived. He moved the plaque with him. And on it were two words, Ebenezer and Jehovah Jireh. And the first word, Ebenezer, means uh, up to now the Lord has uh, helped us, or in the past the Lord has been with us, provided for us. And the second word means the Lord will see to it, or the Lord will provide for us in the future. So one uh, looks back on how the Lord has been with us. The other looks forward as how the Lord will provide in the future. One reflects on God's faithfulness. The other reflects on God's assurances. And we see the midwives having a very similar outlook in life. Uh, as they look down or back, as she shows in the picture, down or back over their lives, they can see how God has, pro has provided for the people of Israel. And of course, they would have been aware, as would have all of the people of Israel, of the promises God had made for them. So they saw, they looked up or looked forward to those promises. They were assured of the provision that God would provide for them. And so that's how they can uh, boldly take an active part in uh, God's work. They can look forward with confidence because they are so very aware of the history of God's uh, presence uh, with their people. And so they acted with bravery that was anything but ordinary. This past week, I was listening to the radio in my car one afternoon, uh, a time that I don't generally uh, 
I'm not generally in my car and tuned into Spirit 95 out of Bloomington, a uh, worship uh, station. But I heard a DJ say there, she was talking about uh, when she gets discouraged, uh, her phrase that she uh, backs herself up with is, get your brave on. <laughs> She said uh, she's been turning to that phrase a lot more since the pandemic hit. Uh, but she has also been so very aware how God has been there in her past that it really helps her look uh, forward to the future. She said, God has helped me get my brave on before, and I know God can help me get my brave on now and as we move forward uh, in the days to come. The lesson that we have in our scripture today is that for every moral action and every decision that we make, we should be grounding ourselves in our trust and dependence on God. And we can see that in the history here of First Christian Church. Some of you may not be aware of some of these things, and I want to make sure that you know these stories. So when uh, this uh, sanctuary was built, it was completed in the late 1800s. And a lot of churches established during that time did not even think about building um, wings on, adding on to their sanctuaries with education space until like the 40s, 50s, most of them actually not till the 60s. But this congregation saw a need uh, for their members and for their community to have more space and, and wanted to build the education building in the 20s, actually. That building was finished in 27. Um, and so they had to find a way to fund that. And what they did was they sold fried chicken dinners off the front steps of the church to people who at that time were driving right through the middle of town on their way to IU football games. And by selling those chicken dinners, they were able to, to really pay for the majority of the education building. Some years later, when the Disciple House property across the street became available, uh, they decided they needed to purchase that, even though they were up against great odds and not even sure how they were going to fund it. But they saw that the future was there uh, for having that property, and so through solicited donations, they were able to purchase that property. That property then opened up a great opportunity for the Haven Youth Center. Uh, again, a need was seen. Middle schoolers in this community had nothing to do after school. They were sitting on the steps of the library in, in large droves, and so they needed some place to go and something to do. And so the Disciple House, or I'm sorry, the Haven Youth Center uh, was birthed some uh, over 21 years ago and has been providing after school care now for fifth, sixth, and seventh seventh and eighth graders uh, that are considered the middle school range, um, free of charge to the families, a great ministry that continues in this community. Not too long after that, there was again uh, seen a need for uh, feeding folks in our community, and the community table was birthed. That was uh, over 17 years ago. Uh, this church saw that it was a big, big undertaking and knew that it was going to be hard for them to do alone, and so they elicited other churches and uh, organizations to help put teams together in order to provide meals free for anybody who wanted to walk in the doors here on Monday evenings. That... Uh, uh, community table meal has become way more about the community than the table. They absolutely love, of course, a hot uh, meal on Monday nights. But what people are missing right now during the pandemic when we're, we've had to halt the community table is they miss the fellowship and the community. This church also was very instrumental in the uh, bringing into Martinsville the Wellsprings um, family shelter, the only family shelter in Morgan County. That shelter has really served so many families in this community. It has emergency housing, and now they have Hope Springs uh, transitional housing, and they are changing lives there. And this church was fundamental in seeing that organization get off the ground. Again, because it saw a need and decided to get involved. First Christian Church has leaned upon God in the face of many struggles over the years, even struggles within the congregation. They have leaned to God and gone to God for direction during uh, divisive times. They have listened to God on how they can most uh, and best care for one another and show the grace of God to all. They have tuned into God to be an example of who this church truly is um, here in Martinsville. 
And so I know as we look back on that, we can also look forward. We can, in the midst of this pandemic, uh, know that we can make decisions as we lean on God and how we can care for one another, how we can support one another and get through this mess of a time in the world. We look to God because we can know in the past God has been with us right up to this very moment. And as we look to the future, we know God will provide as we seek to be the church God calls us to be here from 89 South Main in Martinsville, Indiana. Looking back, looking forward, we can be brave. Will you pray with me? Oh, most holy God, you are faithful indeed. How you provide for us and how you call us to be church, oh God. It is you that gives us the courage to stand in confidence and courage, Lord, to be brave in the face of uncertainty, Lord, to be brave in the face of injustice, to be brave, oh God, in those places where someone, Lord, needs our help. Thank you for the many ways you have led and encouraged First Christian Church and for the many ways you will continue to lead us to be the church in the future. Through the power of Christ that we pray. Amen. Uh, I was talking with Pastor uh, Larry Kuntz, uh, Pastor Emeritus here at First Christian, and he gave me permission to share this little story with you. Another uh, way that this church stepped out ahead of its time was in putting in the elevator, which now everyone thinks, well, of course we have an elevator. But the time they put it in, most churches were not even thinking that way. But again, this speaks so highly of this church and its welcome. It wants to make sure everybody has access to worship in this space. And so they had put in the elevator, they hadn't had it very long, and they finally got someone to come out and do the inspection on it. And so uh, the inspector is there talking with Pastor Larry and uh, member uh, Hobie Fulford, who was uh, kind of in charge of the whole elevator project. And the inspector said, well, I have a long list of things here that you're going to have to meet, all these requirements you're going to have to meet. And Pastor Larry said, oh, well, well, could I make a copy of your book there so we'll know what we are needing to do? And he's like, oh, no, you couldn't possibly make a copy of this. I couldn't allow you to do that. Pastor Larry said, well, then is it possible that I could get a copy of that book? How can I get one? And the gentleman started telling him about where he could get one in one of the, the local uh, offices. And he said, oh, no, you can't get, they're, they're not available right now. There aren't any available. Pastor Larry's thinking, okay, great. So you won't let me have a copy of that, but I can't get a copy of my own. This is not very fair. Well, the inspector and uh, Hobie went off to inspect the elevator and, well, Pastor Larry made a copy of his book. <laughs> so kind of sounds like what the midwives would have done, doesn't it? But that kind of oompspa, that kind of cunning, that kind of forethinking is just what this church has done for years. Finding ways to stand up to an injustice and provide what is just for those who walk in our doors. And uh, it is such an honor to be part of a congregation that stands so justly for the community. We can do that because Christ stood in the midst of uh, so much injustice to bring justice for all. He stood to make sure that even though we are saturated with sin, that we might be forgiven of that sin, that we might be washed clean. He came and sacrificed his life that we might have life eternal in a place we can't even imagine. It's so glorious. That's what we remember as we come to this table and partake of this meal. We're reminded of Christ's sacrifice, of the justice, of the gift, of the grace, of the forgiveness, all of that wrapped up in bread and cup. And we say thank you. We come and commune with our Lord, standing with him and seeking justice as well. Jesus and his disciples were gathered in a large upper room. They were there to celebrate the Passover meal. Those gathered at the table, they had celebrated this meal with Christ before, and they thought this was one more time they'd be doing it again next year. But Christ was fully aware that that was not the case because he knew what was going to happen in the next few hours. 
He tried to explain it to them, and they just had not been able to wrap their heads around it. And so as he looked around the table, he saw Judas there. Judas, who was going to betray him in just a few hours. His eye then fell on Peter. Peter, one that had been in his inner circle so close to him. And yet Peter was going to deny he'd ever known him later that night. Jesus was aware of what was going to happen in the garden. He knew about the mock trial. He knew about everything that was going to come with Calvary. He also knew about the tomb where he'd lie cold and alone. But beyond all of that darkness, that evil, he knew about resurrection. He knew about the light, the life, the power, the brilliance and joy that would come with resurrection. The knowledge of that and the joy in that knowledge kept him there for that one last supper. So during that meal, he stood and he took bread and he lifted it to heaven and he blessed it. He broke it and he passed it among them. He said to them, take and eat of this, all of you. This represents my body given in sacrifice for you. I ask that when you do this in the future, you remember me and my amazing love for you. It wasn't long before he stood again and he took a cup and he lifted that to heaven and blessed it. And he passed that among them as well. He said to them, take and drink of this, all of you, this. This is the blood of the new covenant. And when you do this, Remember me and my love for you. For these gifts, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of your son. We thank you for all that you have given us. We pray that you will help us persevere as we walk through this world that challenges you at every step. We thank you for all the many, many blessings that you bestow upon us. Go with us always. In Jesus' most holy name we do pray. Amen.
And through his blood, we are made new. We have been blessed by the gifts of communion, and now we have the opportunity to bring our gifts before the Lord. We lay before God our offerings, our tithes, and our prayers of intercession. Father, we do thank you for the many blessings that you do bestow upon us. We pray, Father, that we might look back on the blessings that you give us, but look forward to what we can do with these gifts that we bring forward today, that it might make your word and your works more alive in our community and our lives. Go with us always. In Jesus' most holy name we do pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us for worship this week. I pray that uh, it has been a blessing to you to be here with us today. My challenge to you for this week is get your brave on. All right? God is with you. We know he's been with us in the past, and he will be with us as we move forward through this pandemic. I know that a lot of us look at this pandemic, and we are like, we're done. But apparently it's not done with us. So we got to get our brave on and move on through together. May God bless you through this next week. Pray you can join us again. Thank you. Let's join our voices in our closing song, Better Is One Day. Better is a one day in your house, 
better is a one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. My heart and flesh cry out for you, the living God. Your spirit waters to my soul. I've tasted and I've seen. Come once again to me. I will draw near to you. I will draw near to you, to you. Better is a one day, better is a one day, better is a one day than thousands elsewhere. Better is a one day, better is a one day, better is a one day than thousands elsewhere. Better is a one day in your courts. Better is a one day in your house. Better is a one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Better is a one day in your courts. Better is a one day in your house. Better is a one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Better is a one day in your courts. Better is a one day in your house. Better is a one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Better is a one day in your courts. Better is a one day in your house. Better is a one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. was moving me to do a little